So this will be a special seminar on innovation and culture. And it's a little bit of an academic seminar. It's a research seminar that I gave uh, last year at the Azielix. But it relates to the previous lecture about innovation and culture, the East-West uh, divergence, uh, Silicon Valley, startup nation in Israel, and so forth. And the key point from that lecture was the importance of a ecosystem that uh, intersects and has many different uh, skill sets, many different people, many different uh, abilities coming together to produce innovation. Because as you recall, the definition of innovation from the first class was not just a new idea, but the implementation of the new idea in society with a lasting impact. And that's not just to creativity, that's not just one skill, one technology or one technique or one idea, it requires a very complex ecosystem. And so this seminar is going to explore that in more detail and how Korea has solved that problem, created an ecosystem for innovation. The title of the seminar is The Historical Development and Ascendancy of Family-Owned Business Conglomerates in Korea, also known as Chebo, as an adaptation to cultural transaction costs. And I will end the seminar with some implications for new models of startup-driven innovation. As mentioned, this was presented at the ASEALIX conference in Seoul at Sun Kyung Kwan University last July. And it was in collaboration with Dr. Jang Hyun Kim, also a professor at Sung Kyung Kwan University. So by way of outline, I'll be talking about the history and development of Chebos. Many of you are familiar with this. A theory of the firm, which is actually a well-established academic discipline with practical implications, of course, in the business world and business schools, management theory, so theory of the firm. Then I'll talk about the establishment of business ecosystems and ecosystem and innovation transaction costs, and then cultural transaction costs and Chebol development as an adaptation to these cultural transaction costs. And finally, as mentioned, implications for startup driven innovation. So let's start with the history and development of Chebols. All of you, of course, and many around the world are familiar with Korean Chebols. They have uh, very common names and, and famous names such as Samsung, Hyundai, SK, LG, Lotte, Pasco, GS, and uh, many others. And uh, these Chebols are, of course, a very important part, as we shall see, of the Korean economy. So what is the definition of a Chebol? The word Chebol is a combination of the Korean word Che for wealth and ball for clan or clique. And the two characteristics of Chebols are that they are family owned and they consist of subsidiaries across diverse industries. So for example, the Samsung Chebol, most people are familiar with smartphones and maybe some chips, of course, semiconductor chips, but that's just Samsung Electronics. There's Samsung Huajie, which is the insurance. There's Samsung uh cnt which is construction there's samsung engineering which is also construction there's uh, everland which is an amusement park there's uh samsung card which is related to financial services there's uh used to be samsung uh techwin which was in the defense industry and so extraordinarily diverse industries some of which don't seem to have any real uh product uh, connection and so forth. And um, let's talk a little bit about how the Chebols dominate South Korea's economy. Now, all of you know this, of course, but uh, if you look in detail at the market capitalization, which is the overall uh, value on the stock market of companies, and you add them up for the Chebols, and then you add up the ones for the non-Chebols, you get over three quarters, 77% of uh, the market capitalization is dominated by these Chebols. Uh, 
with Samsung being 41%. Now they say for in terms of the GDP of Korea, Samsung is about 25%. So this is market capitalization. It's not the same as GDP, but the bottom line is the same. The Che balls are extremely dominant in the South Korean economy. And the total non Che ball uh, is uh, obviously 23%. Now, what has been the history and development of these Che balls? So in the 19, after the World War uh, and uh, the Korean War, there was favorable treatment from the government in terms of assets and so forth, a military takeover, uh, cleaned up some of those Che balls, but also supported them. There was a further uh, con uh, consolidation in 1970s, a further expansion in 1980s. There was the Asian economic crisis, which uh, pushed back some of the Che balls, but that was generally across the economy. And of course, uh, continued sustained uh, growth of these Che balls which is very interesting because there has been a lot of crisis. There is a lot of been uh, pushback from government even, uh, and uh, people, as they say, have a love and hate relationship with the Che balls in Korea, but uh, they have continued to persist. Now, you might say living in Korea, that that's obvious. Samsung has been here your whole life and it will always be there your whole life. It's, it's, that's just the way uh, it is, but this is actually very surprising to other people who are not from Korea. Uh, if we look at Western conglomerates, so Western companies did have these diversified conglomerates. They might not have been quite family owned, but uh, they did have diverse industries. And if we look at the sort of uh, performance measurements of these conglomerates, you have performance of the company gets better and better as the company gets bigger. But as the company gets really big, then that performance goes down as this uh, figure shows. And why is this? Well, as the diversification increases, you gain some economies of scope and scale and you get more effective with much bigger and so forth. And that's well known, but you also get organizational complexity and you get loss of synergies and that raises the uh, administrative costs. And that's why after a certain point, these Western conglomerates actually uh, were not very high performing. Another very important concept in business is the concept of core competency and focusing. And this was very important in the 1990s and uh, has persisted to this day that companies should focus on one thing and do it very excellent in order to be world-class and the best, doing many different things uh, some of them not related is a distraction to management, is a distraction to efficiency. And basically those types of companies get their stock price lowered. They get uh, attacked uh, financially. They get broken up by private equity firms. And this has been a process in the 1980s and 1990s in the West and uh, continuing to this day. So they rose in the 1960s, these conglomerates. Uh, it was a way to get around antitrust limitations, but they were brought down by these inefficiencies, as I mentioned. So if you look at the total diversification, you get, uh, if you start with one in 1980, total diversification by the number of segments in the industry segments uh, went down by 25%. And if you look at unrelated diversification, so diversification like Samsung, where you have insurance and electronics and uh, uh, bio and all this, uh, went down markedly to just uh, 0.35. So uh, even though the number of companies remained the same, their diversification really uh, decreased. So companies became more focused. Now you might say 3M is very diverse and very in innovative, but 3M is not really that diverse. It has a diverse product portfolio, but it's not diverse in the sense of many different sectors that uh, it operates like Korean chables. So this is a very curious fact. Why are these uh, Korean chaebols still existing very strongly, in fact, stronger than before? So we're gonna to try to answer that question. It's a very important question for innovation. It's a very important question for Korea. One of the interesting things about these chaebols is they are very dominant in the economy and that internal transactions, transactions between the subsidiaries or they call them affiliates, 
uh, are very significant. And this is an article that says that internal trade makes up 12% of conglomerate transactions. So you may say Samsung Junja, uh, Samsung Electronics makes smartphones for the world and makes smartphones for many other people. They also make smartphones for other Samsung affiliates. Uh, when I was working at Samsung, we had our email system our, uh, was made by Samsung SDS, IT company. And our monitors, our computers were all Samsung, of course. So everything, uh, not everything, but a large part of these transactions and economic value are internal transactions. So that's very important to keep in mind. Now, this, as I mentioned, raises some important questions. Is government influence the main driver of Chebol growth? So there's been a lot of talk about unfair government support for Chebols. And uh, we've seen Chebol growth even when the governments, including today, when the governments have tried to limit the Chebols. And uh, I think this concept of corruption or uh, back dealing and so forth uh, is may not be a significant matter in these growth and sustainability of chaebols. Their uh, government may be a part of it, but I don't think that that's the main reason. I'm going to explain why. So how do we explain the persistence of chaebols in the face of these uh, almost existential threats like the 1987 democracy movement, the IMF crisis, and the recent anti chaebol reform efforts? How do they keep going? What is the how do we explain the Chebol strength, not just in terms of Korean politics, but also the economic uh, issues like the drivers of efficiency that have basically uh, destroyed the Western uh, conglomerates. Uh, there are very few of them. In fact, there's very almost none that are comparable to the Chebols. There's a similar concept of Keirutsu in Japan, but we are going to focus on Korean Chebols. So now we go to what we call the theory of the firm. As I mentioned, if we're going to answer the question, why do chables exist? We should base that on more fundamental theories of why do companies exist? Why does a company exist? Think about that. Why should a company exist? It seems obvious to us. Uh, obviously there are reasons about capitalization and money and scale and manufacturing, sort of, et cetera. But this is a very serious area of inquiry and actually econo economists have gotten Nobel prizes based on developing this theory. So the theory of the firm consists of economic theories that explain and predict the nature of the firm, the company, the corporation, including why it exists, how it acts, what is its structure and its relationship to the market. So there are several theories of the firm. Uh, three major ones are related to profit. So for example, the firm exists to maximize the profit in the short run or the long run. Uh, and there's all, we're not gonna go into all these theories, but uh, that's what they focus on profit. The other one are uh, optimizing theories and managerial theories, and that's the easiest way to manage these processes. Uh, Self-satisfying -satisf uh, behavior, uh, and as well as behavioral th theory, just uh, social aspects and, and how people work together and so forth. Ultimately, the bottom line is for a firm to exist, there should be more benefit than cost. Uh, if it was uh, very, uh, there was no cost to making a firm, then we would have only one company in the whole world, just one global company because there's no cost associated with creating that firm. Why do we have many different companies? So this is a very interesting and open question. And so there's a large body of academic material related to the theory of the firm. And we're going to use that to help explain the concept of chables and their persistence. So one of the most important theories of the firm is related to transaction cost theory. This was by a very famous and very brilliant economist called Ronald Coase. Uh, and he got the Nobel Prize in 1991 for this uh, sort of work. And uh, since modern firms can only emerge when an entrepreneur, so all of you may want to, or some of you may want to be entrepreneurs, but uh, you want to create a company. And so why do you create a company? You're going to hire people. So Coase's analysis proceeds by considering the conditions under which it makes sense 
for an entrepreneur to seek hired help instead of contracting out for some particular task. So for example, you can create a startup with just you and no employees. You just do all your work with contractors uh, and you make uh, contracts with all these people for manufacturing, for marketing, for legal work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now you can already imagine that that gets to be very difficult because if you want to produce a product, but you're spending all your time writing contracts with people to execute on your plan, you spend all this transaction cost with these contracts and reviewing the contracts, writing the contracts and, and dealing with all the transaction that it makes more sense just to bring them in the company. You make an employment contract and that's it. And, and, uh, uh, you go from there. That's the fundamental concept. So there are different types of transaction costs. There are internal transaction costs, the company within itself. Uh, so if you have a lawyer working in your company, there's some internal transaction costs, but those might be less than the external transaction costs if you were to essentially just hire the services or contract the services of an external lawyer. So you remember I was talking about the internal transaction costs of the Chaebols, and that provides an interesting clue as to why the Chaebols exist. Uh, internal transaction costs among the affiliates. So you have internal transaction costs and external transaction costs. So the bottom line is for a firm to exist, its internal transaction costs for that uh, situation should be less than what they would do with the external transaction costs if they didn't have those employees. So we can look at this a little bit more detail. So if the, this is cost, this is the internal transaction costs, roughly constant. The external transaction costs, uh, if the external transaction costs go are very, very low. If it's very easy to get, not have employees, but be very easy to work with outside people, uh, then you're all going to be all network. Your firm, your company will be very small. You don't need a big company if the external transaction costs are very low. But in general, the external transaction costs are not always very low. As I said, you have to make all the contracts, you have to review the contracts and, and, and enforce the contracts and so forth. So then uh, if the external transaction costs get more and more, then it makes sense to internalize those tasks and therefore you create a firm. And if the external transaction costs are very high, then you do everything in the company and we call that vertical integration. And then you could even have, if it's very extreme, horizontal integration, in other words, diverse uh, companies. So this is the basic paradigm of transaction cost theory. So how do we establish business ecosystems? What is a business ecosystem? We said that those business ecosystems were very, very important for successful innovation in Silicon Valley and in uh, Israel. So you have a core business, then you have an extended enterprise with various suppliers, customers, 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 and then you have the wider business ecosystem that we said is very important for innovation, including trade associations, public bodies, the academic institutions, the research organizations, unions, competitors, other stakeholders, investors, professional services, legal accounting, and all that. So this is a little bit complicated, but it talks about network theory, relationship networks, and multiplicity. Uh, so if you're working with many different uh, partners in a complex ecosystem, then you have simplex view of relationships where there's basically one-to-one -one here and then multiplex where you get much more complexity. And if you have high multiplexity, very complex relationships, and it's very difficult, then your friendship network, your advice network, your networks are very confined. If you have low multiplexity, then your uh, networks can be separated. So what are some types of transaction costs? Uh, these are search and information costs. For example, if you want to work with outside partners, you have to find them, you have to identify them, you have to uh, gather information about them, you have to see if you can trust them and so forth. 
Then you have the bargaining and decision costs. Those are the costs to make the contracts, the time spent at meetings, time expended in written verbal communications to, to organize those uh, networks. And then policing and enforcement costs, making sure that the job is done, uh, doing regular reporting, meetings and all this. These are transaction costs related to all these networks. Now, as we mentioned, the Silicon Valley innovation ecosystem has all of these components. And we said there are two things that are important. The components must exist, but those components should be able to work together easily because a startup does not have, you know, all those functions internalized. The startup by definition is small and it must be able to easily interact with all these different pieces and all these different stakeholders and all these different uh, organizations and other companies and other people easily uh, in order to create the value. Their external transaction costs must be low. And the same thing holds for Israel. Now, when it comes to cultural transaction costs, let's talk about the role of culture in business. So this is Peter Drucker, very famous business guru. Some of you may have heard the name. And he has a famous quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, it's a kind of a phrase in English, but it basically means that culture is even more important than strategy. He's a strategy guru, strategy consultant, maybe one of the most famous in business world. Uh, and he says strategy is actually not the key thing. Culture is the key thing. And that's very important for innovation. That's why it's a big topic for our lectures and a topic for this seminar. So now I bring all this together and the central thesis is that the Chabals developed and they also sustained their uh, strength as an adaptation to cultural transaction costs. Uh, and this is related to uh, culture in Korea. And this is a, a good friend of mine. He's a professor at uh, SUNY Songdo in Incheon, uh, State University of New York, Korea. Uh, Professor Joseph Cabe, and he gives lecture on four core characteristics of Korean people. One of them is Uri, community focused. The other one is Soyo, which is the seniority system and so forth, sometimes in a negative sense, the whole gapchil and everything. And then there's uh, Kunmyon, the idea of working hard and being diligent. Uh, and then there's Chaemyon, which is the shame culture, you don't want to look bad. Uh, and not say anything wrong, and so very quiet and so forth. And then there's Pali Pali, uh, which is a, a fast, fast or sense of urgency. These are five core characteristics of Korean culture. And it's not bad or good or whatever, that's not the point. These are just uh, very common features. Two of them in particular make it very difficult to create a random, non-formally uh, introduced networks. In Korea, you just don't uh, go to a senior person, and say, hello, how are you doing? You know, you have to figure out, you know, chondet mal, pan mal, you have to have some relationship, you have to be introduced. It's, it's just, uh, as we say in Korea, isang hai. If you just walk up to somebody and do a cold call and, and say you want to do business and so forth, it's much more comfortable and much more expected and much more civilized to do it in an organized setting. Now, in this innovation culture, like Silicon Valley in Israel, uh, all these groups are coming together, not on the basis of this civilized way, if you will, but they're coming together much more spontaneously and much more uh, unorganized way. Uh, and so that doesn't fit into uh, the way Korean culture normally operates. And the same with face saving. You don't want to just do this because you might be embarrassed. You might say the wrong thing. You might uh, be inappropriate, you might be rude, you might be impolite. All these things are going through the mind. You cannot do this kind of thing. And so it's much easier to function within your own network. We call these cultural transaction costs. And they are the same inhibition as, of course, a financial transaction cost or a time transaction cost. If it, it costs money to work with an outside lawyer, 
uh, that's just as difficult as if it is uncomfortable to talk with an outside lawyer because they didn't come from the same school or maybe they're older than you and it would be impolite if I talk with them and all these other things that go with the Korean drama as it were. So these are the cultural transaction costs. So the fundamental concept is that the Chebols have in a sense created in the family uh, or at least with a feeling of the family, a internal ecosystem where it's comfortable to go to the next person. So if Samsung has a fab for a semiconductor a factory, Kongjang for the uh, uh, semiconductor, Pandoche, they can just go to Samsung construction. They don't have to go and search around with strangers to do their construction work. If that building needs to be insured, they go to Samsung Huaje. Very easy, very simple. If Samsung Janja needs an IT system, they go to Samsung SDS. Very easy. It's not as e it's much easier culturally than going to you know some outside company. Uh, it might even be more expensive to go with Samsung SDS. But the cultural barrier is much less. So you decide to do that. So many people have talked about corruption and all these sorts of things as an issue. And I'm not apologizing for the Che balls. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just saying that it may not be that much about a corruption issue. It's just a comfort issue. In other words, the cultural transaction cost, which is grounded in the theory of the firm right, by Ronald Coase. So we have examples of this, of great uh, societies that create a lot of innovation. We talked about ancient Rome and it reduced the cultural transaction costs. Strangers could come in, become Roman citizens, bring their ideas and innovate. And you have very powerful Roman empire. And the Dutch golden age, where the Dutch were the, the most uh, uh, prolific of the merchants in business for about a uh, hundred years, in the late 16th and early 17th century. And of course they went to Indonesia, Japan and all over uh, Asia and uh, also Africa and uh, the South America. Singapore in the present time. And of course a perfect example is uh, America and Silicon Valley where many, it's very comfortable just to interact with different groups and that's just part of the culture. And so they don't need chables. They kind of have their own chebol as the whole nation. Their own chebol is all of Rome. Their own chebol is all of New York City or, or all of Silicon Valley. They don't need a chebol to create these ecosystems. So what are the implications for startup driven growth? So the chebols are very powerful. And then how can the startup compete with them? Startup has to create these networks. And so uh, as, I, as you know, the Chebols are huge market capitalization, but most of the employment is in smaller companies. So this startup driven innovation is extremely important. The Chebols are very useful, very valuable. They create a lot of products, they create a lot of value, but they don't really employ a lot of people and they don't, uh, they have other issues. So how do we make startups more successful like the Chebol? Well, as I said, this is the basic facts of economics. The, when the external transaction costs are very high, you go to more consolidated companies. You cannot do a more networked operation. Startups operate here and chables operate here. And why the chables operate are successful? Because those external transaction costs are very high. Now, as I mentioned, these are cultural transaction costs. So that means to some extent, you need to change the culture, but that's very difficult. And I propose that that is not necessarily the solution. China is an Asian country, of course, but uh, they don't have the same limits. If you look at Chinese businessmen around the world and uh, how they interact, uh, they don't have the same, even though it's the same Confucian concept, they don't have the same limitations. And one concept is perhaps the cultural revolution upended a lot of that and changed a lot of those relationships that still are prevalent uh, here, even though we're obviously very developed here in Korea. So one option is to change the culture. And I think that's very difficult, if not impossible, certainly not in the short run. 
So as I mentioned, instead of lowering the internal transaction costs, we need to lower those external transaction costs and be aware of these cultural differences. So if you create an ecosystem in Pangyo and uh, uh, they can't interact, what is the good of that? Nothing's gonna happen. So how can we do this without going through a cultural revolution? And I think the key is to bring in more global engagement, bring in more diverse people into those companies uh, so that that becomes like a seed and a ability to do that kind of engagement. And uh, everyone works together, but if you have uh, uh, foreign people in uh, Korean startups and working and engaging with outside groups, that's a way to jumpstart in the short run and create those networks uh, without cultural revolution or without creating new chaebol. So in summary, I talked about the history and development of chaebols, the theory of the firm, which is very well established. Obviously they're competing theories, but this idea of a theory of firm is well established. The establishment of business ecosystems and the transaction costs related to the establishment of those ecosystems, cultural transaction costs as being extremely important. In fact, the main reason for chaebol development as an adaptation to those cultural transaction costs and the implications for startup driven innovation. So I'll close with one last thought about the fourth industrial revolution. Everybody's been talking about the fourth industrial revolution, which we are presumably living in now. And if we look in the past at the previous three industrial revolutions, we see that those three were dominated by particular technologies. So for example, the first industrial revolution was do dominated by steam engines. The second industrial revolution was dominated by electricity. And the third industrial revolution was dominated by automation and computers. The fourth industrial revolution will likely not be dominated by a single technology, but rather by technology convergence, different technologies coming together. We already see that self-driving cars self-driving electric cars. That's a combination of battery technology, electric uh, motors, AI, radar, uh, and, uh, AI, and uh, uh, all those technologies coming together. And so technology convergence is the essence of the fourth industrial revolution, not one technology, but technology convergence, which means that intrinsically, not just the theory of the firm, but how this technology and innovation is occurring must have convergence and must have connections between different parts of the ecosystem. The isolated technology coming out of a research lab and becoming a company and big is uh, basically obsolete. And so these concepts of transaction costs and ecosystem development and interacting with a diverse group of individuals is central not just to innovation, but essentially to the fourth industrial revolution and how business is working now. So that's my presentation, the seminar, special seminar. It's related to, of course, to the topics that we talked about, but zooms in a little bit more detail on uh, chaebols and their significance in Korea, what lessons we can learn and uh, how we can further improve the innovation position in Korea.